development at the time, and in spite of the Wright's attempts to build efficient propellers, supplementary power in the form of a catapult was needed to help the flyers become airborne. The idea of the canard was to reduce the likelihood of stalling and to provide pitch or vertical control. The two closely mounted pusher propellers were driven by chains from a central engine. One of the chains was crossed so that the pusher propellers turned in opposite directions, eliminating the tendency of engine torque to make the airplane fly around in circles. But future developments brought an apparent end to the canard, which had been so useful to the Wrights in their exploration of powered flight. Instead, pitch control was moved to the rear of the aircraft. Meanwhile, the wings were placed toward the front, and the engine more toward the center. Yet in many cases, the pusher format was retained, and the propeller still placed behind the wing. Glenn Curtis's headless pusher got its name from the lack of a canard wing. But even he, the Wright brothers' great rival, stuck with the pusher propeller design for quite a while. Blériot, the great French aviator, used two ideas which would later become mainstream in aircraft design. The forward-mounted tractor propeller and the single wing surface, better known as the monoplane. But the strongest influence on aviation since the Wright's first flight was about to make its mark. When World War I erupted in Europe in 1914, it became apparent that many new technologies designed to help man would be turned against him. Flying machines, a new and very raw form of transportation, were quickly adapted for war. With a new, deadlier emphasis now placed on speed and payload, the forward-mounted engine and the tractor propeller became standard designs. As performance continued to improve, the pusher engine was left behind. The new radial power plant became the engine of choice. And because it was air-cooled, it had to be mounted at the front of the plane. And with a forward-mounted radial engine, the logical extension was a tractor propeller. Soon, production demands for this new design became insatiable. Even so, some pushers survived and proved very useful. The war in the Atlantic wasn't fought above the waves, but below them. And a new weapon, the German U-boat, became a menacing adversary to the vital shipping lanes that kept the Allied war effort afloat. To counter the U-boat threat, the flying boat was put into action with a pusher engine mounted high and inboard on the fuselage to protect it from salt water. It was able to fly slowly over long distances and was ideally suited for sub -hunting. The war, reaching unprecedented levels, mobilized immense industrial forces, men and women working side by side. In the span of less than four years, Tens of thousands of vastly improved aircraft were pumped off of factory lines. And although mass production led to standardization, aviation experimentation went on. Anything that could conceivably provide an edge over the enemy was brought to bear. And in the air, that didn't always mean conventional planes. A combination of pusher and tractor propellers were used to power the huge airships that sought out enemy subs. In the euphoria following the peace of 1918, the massive mobilization and incredible industrial efforts geared towards making war dissipated. Aircraft development slowed to an almost pre-war state. Lessons had indeed been learned, but the motivation to innovate was no longer present. Yet one wartime byproduct that did achieve lasting fame, even after peace set in, was the Curtis series of NC flying boats. In 1919, this long-range sub-hunter was the first plane to successfully cross the Atlantic. 
The MC had four engines and, like the dirigibles, used them in a push-pull configuration with three forward-facing tractor propellers and one pusher facing to the rear. Compared to the First World War, the air war that began in 1939 was massive, total, and unforgiving. Theories of strategic bombing only discussed in 1917 became daily practice. Armadas of four-engine bombers droned over enemy targets in both Europe and the Pacific, leveling the cities beneath them. And in the skies above, some 200,000 airmen would lose their lives. Fuel requirements were considerable, so most of the space was taken up by the fuel tanks that enabled each bomber to travel to and from its target. With the increased weight and decreased payloads caused by this, these planes, when compared to modern bombers, were relatively inefficient. But long-range strategic bombing was a devastating weapon nevertheless, even though tens of thousands of airmen were needed to fly and defend these vast aerial forces. Because of this manpower and material drain, new formulas for waging the air war were constantly sought. The commitment to produce and man thousands of four-engine heavy bombers had exorbitant costs. Back home in America, planners searched for a cheaper way out. One of the most ambitious attempts at producing an inexpensive bomber was underway in America long before the war's end. The Douglas Company tackled this challenge with as much creativity as the most adventurous manufacturers of the day. Company engineers argued that if a plane was produced that was faster than German fighters, it wouldn't need the many gunners and heavy armor that made contemporary bombers so expensive. Douglas designers intended to concentrate power from two engines into a pusher propeller at the rear of the airframe. Because of this, their B-42 would have enough power to lift a bomb load as great as a B-17's. The mixed master, as the 42 was called, only needed three crewmen, one of whom was responsible for all of the aircraft's defensive gunnery. Its bomb load was equal to that of a heavy bomber, but its speed approached that of the fighters of the era. The plane wasn't finished in time to see service during World War II, but its legendary ingenuity, its ability to use agility rather than brute force, is acclaimed even today. Although the B-42 Mixmaster was never put into service, its contribution was major because its airframe was later modified, becoming America's first jet-powered bomber, the B-43. The B-43 itself never got past the prototype stage, but it did lead the way, inspiring and influencing jet bomber designers of the entire post-war era. Another experimental wartime project was Northrop's N-9M. A small-scale design study for a large bomber project, it was a flying wing with two pusher engines. The pusher concept was chosen because it provided the cleanest possible airflow over the wing and because of its efficient shape. The full-scale bomber was supposed to have a 10,000-mile range, so streamlining was paramount. The N9M was powered by two Franklin engines that were raised above the level of the wing. In this way, only the air that flowed over the top of the wing struck the propellers. This prevented air of different pressure coming from below the wing and upsetting the airflow. The N9M performed well, and work soon began on the full-scale version. But because of production delays, it wasn't ready by the time the war ended. 
Ironically, it was the pusher system that was the downfall of the XB-35, as the full-scale version of the N9M was called. The engines were buried deep within the wing, and the gearing mechanism transferring power to the propellers was extremely complex. Each engine drove a pair of counter-rotating propellers with a design that never really worked properly. Problems with both the gearing mechanism and the propellers led to compromises. This flying wing never reached its full potential as a piston engine pusher aircraft. The major compromise of the XB-35's pusher design was the discarding of the counter-rotating system and the fitting of standard propellers to each engine. This led to a severe loss of power, and the test flight program of the XB-35 almost ended before it began. But when jet engines arrived on the scene, the flying wing was given another chance because the design was uniquely suited for conversion to jet power. Jet engines fit quite readily into the airframe, and this surreal plane didn't need any other major alteration except for the addition of vertical fins for directional stability. The fins were needed because, in the piston engine version, the propeller shaft housings and the propellers themselves had provided a stabilizing effect. The new aircraft, now called the YB-49, performed very well indeed, breaking records for both time in the air and for crossing the continent. But in bombing tests, the YB-49 suffered from a tendency to yaw, making accurate bomb runs very difficult. At the time, Northrop was developing a turboprop engine which they hoped would make their pusher concept work. But without official support, the project lapsed, and Northrop's flying wing became part of aviation folklore. The Bell Aerocuda was a pre-war design dating back to 1936 and built by the fledgling Bell Aircraft Company of Buffalo, New York. The Bell team, led by Robert Woods, came up with a unique pusher concept using two wing-mounted engines, each housed in a nacelle big enough to accommodate a gunner. Before the war, many nations had researched twin-engine high-speed fighters, but very few were successful enough to go into production. The Aerocuda was no exception but it did demonstrate Bell's ability to produce innovative designs. Although many pusher designs achieved only limited success, there is one area in which they have truly excelled, as waterborne and amphibious aircraft. Typical of many amphibious designs, the engine and pusher propeller are mounted on a pylon. This arrangement places the propeller and engine as far away from the water as possible. Aircraft of this type have been produced by Germany, Britain, Italy, Canada, France and America. These light amphibian aircraft are designed to cope with a wide variety of tasks, and the high-mounted pusher propeller is the configuration that seems to provide the most flexibility. But if lightweight amphibians and seaplanes are smaller examples of pusher-powered aircraft, then the gigantic B-36 of the post-war era is an example situated to the other end of the spectrum. The first prototype was the XB-36, and even by today's standards, it was an enormous aircraft. 
It relied on six huge radial engines mounted on the trailing edge of its enormous wing. Each engine drove a three-bladed pusher propeller, and even then, it was underpowered. The B-36 Peacemaker is a perfect example of the post-war design trend toward huge aircraft. Aircraft like the British Brabazon, the Princess Flying Boat, Howard Hughes Spruce Goose, and the Lockheed Constitution. All examples of the era's trend toward making planes truly larger than life. And in spite of its major limitations, the B-36 was by far the most successful of the bunch. In the days before aerial refueling, its enormous frame carried enough fuel to give it extremely long range and strike capabilities. But this came with a cost. This first model had a tricycle landing gear with two enormous single main wheels. Only two runways in the entire world could support the incredible weight of the plane when landing, San Diego and Fort Worth. It became evident that the landing gear would have to be modified before the B-36 could be deployed worldwide. Changes were made, but there were still concerns about the aircraft's usefulness and its price. The larger a machine is, the more expensive it becomes. Yet at one time, the B-36 was relegated to maritime reconnaissance work, even though it was built as a strategic bomber. Soon, critics began to question the plane's worth. But a strong lobby within the Air Force believed that the expense was justified, stating that someday, America would sorely need an intercontinental strategic bomber. The Peacemaker's design dates back to the beginning of the Second World War, when piston engines were the only practical form of power available. But by the time the prototypes were finally completed, the jet era had fully arrived, and jets couldn't be fitted into the wing of the B-36. But that became moot because its piston engines were considered more economical anyway. Later, four external jets were added. They were used during takeoff and at high speeds. In reference to its engines, pilots said they had six turning and four burning. And while supporters now considered it a complete aircraft, others called it a hybrid compromise. World events soon silenced the debate because suddenly America urgently needed a long-range bomber. The Cold War was on, and with the development of the hydrogen bomb, the Big Stick, as the B-36 became known, was considered the ultimate aerial deterrent in an age when intercontinental ballistic missiles were only plans on a drawing board. But the cost was high in both money and manpower. The program of building and maintaining a few hundred peacemakers was possible only after the cancellation of several other promising projects. Nevertheless, it was deemed a burden worth bearing. Because in an age of fear, the nation took comfort in having the largest, longest range bomber in an increasingly volatile world. Maintaining these massive airframes cost almost as much as it did to build them. The problems of vibration and fatigue in an aircraft that had a wingspan of over 200 feet required constant attention. Naturally, a rather large ground crew was needed to keep them in flying condition. A typical B-36 mission required the aircraft to stay aloft for almost 24 hours without any aerial refueling. Because of this, the plane needed to accommodate a relief crew, sleeping quarters, and a galley. And the only way the crew could move from the flight deck to their accommodations in the center of the plane was on a trolley running through a narrow tunnel down the fuselage. Less than 400 of the aircraft were built, and within one year of the project's cancellation, over a quarter of these costly machines had been turned into scrap. Luckily, the Peacemaker never went through a single day of combat. The B-36 fleet was by no means self-contained. Globemaster transports flew to all points of the compass in providing them with logistical support. In Alaska, helicopters were on constant standby, 
ready to rescue crewmen from icy waters or from the frozen landscapes of the North Country. As a warplane, the B-36 was the most powerful pusher aircraft ever built, but it was not the largest. That title goes to the only offshoot of the B-36, its transport version, designated the XC-99. With tremendous lifting ability, it is not surprising that many of the world's great bombers have in turn been modified into transport aircraft. When this happens, fuselage design changes are usually necessary. Examples are the B-29, which was modified to become the Stratocruiser, and the British Lancaster bomber, which became the York. Usually, these modifications represent stopgap measures filling in until more specialized aircraft are developed. By far the largest such modification was Convair's XC-99. Ordered by the Air Force as a double-decker troop transport, the XC-99's progress was closely monitored by many of America's civilian airlines. They watched its development intently in anticipation of the boom in civilian air travel expected in the 1950s. Airline executives wagered that if the XC-99 could carry 400 troops, it could easily be modified to accommodate several hundred ticket-buying passengers. Sweetening the pie, much of the transport's development costs had already been borne by Convair and the Air Force, because this enormous plane used exactly the same wings, landing gear, and tailplane as the B-36. But unlike the Peacemaker, it didn't need the bomber's jets, and relied instead on the plane's six pusher engines. For its non-combatant role, these proved more than adequate. But the post-war tourist boom arrived 10 years later than expected, and the only XC-99 built served as a one-of-a-kind military transport, its only real distinction being the largest pusher aircraft ever built. The use of pusher propellers wasn't limited to fixed-wing aircraft. The extraordinary Lockheed Cheyenne wasn't only a compound helicopter with short, stubby wings, wings giving it lift at high speeds. It also had two small rotors on its tail boom. One of these was a normal rotor used to counteract torque and give directional control. But the other was a pure pusher propeller designed to boost high-speed performance. When America became entangled in Vietnam in the early 1960s, the Army's House Board recommended the development of an attack helicopter for close-in troop support and anti-tank operations. Stopgap measures that would have modified existing helicopters were rejected. Instead, an all-out effort was launched to design a completely new and advanced chopper. In 1964, the new machine specifications were issued. They were more than demanding. The helicopter was to have a top speed of 220 knots and hoverability at 6,000 feet. Adding to the challenge was a required range of 2,100 nautical miles. In the end, Lockheed beat out 12 other competitors for the job. To achieve 220 knots, engineers had to depart from conventional helicopter designs. Stub wings were added to the Cheyenne, thus making it a compound helicopter. At the time, Lockheed was relatively new to the helicopter business, and unhindered by years of tradition, they were willing to look to more radical designs. With the addition of a pusher tail rotor, the Cheyenne's layout was drastically different from any other helicopter of the day. The helicopter's development program was long and expensive. For its era, the Cheyenne's electronics and avionics were state-of-the-art, as was the chopper's armament system. Along the way, some unpredicted bugs had to be ironed out. Lockheed's revolutionary hingeless rotor design had been a big factor in the company winning the contract in the first place. But tests revealed that the rotor, which worked well on small helicopters, just wasn't effective on a machine as large as a Cheyenne. The design was modified. 
testing and development continued throughout the late 60s. The Cheyenne came very close to meeting its original specifications, but in the end, it fell short of the mark. The Huey Cobra appeared at just the right time and with just the right capabilities. It wasn't long before it proved itself in combat in Southeast Asia. Meanwhile, the Cheyenne was delayed in development and testing back in the States. The radical nature of Lockheed's design, including the pusher propeller and the expensive state-of-the-art features built into the Cheyenne program, would eventually cause its downfall. Because although the Cobra couldn't match the Cheyenne's outright performance, it had slugged it out in the rice paddies and jungles of Vietnam with vicious efficiency. The Huey Cobra was cheap and rugged. The Cheyenne, built with other battlefields in mind, was enormously expensive and complex. With its single engine, it had doubtful combat survivability. To the Army, the message was clear. The bloody lessons of Vietnam had to be heeded. And the Cobra, financed by Bell as a private venture, leapfrogged over Lockheed Cheyenne straight into combat. The Lockheed Cheyenne was not the first helicopter to use a pusher propeller in the quest for higher speeds. In the early 1950s, the McDonnell Company experimented with rotors powered by small jets in the rotor tips. In their XV-1, they combined this method of propulsion with a pusher propeller. This system enabled them to reach speeds of close to 200 miles an hour, an incredible feat for the time. On this bird, however, the pusher propeller wasn't driven by the main rotor's power plant. It had its own radial engine mounted in the rear of the fuselage. But similar to the Cheyenne, the XV-1 had stub wings that took the load off the rotor at high speeds. The chopper didn't always use its pusher propeller. For hovering and low speed work, it remained stationary. But for higher speeds, the radial engine and the pusher kicked in. By 1955, the XV-1 had achieved some success, reaching speeds of 200 miles an hour. But it shared the problem of all other jet-tip helicopters of the time. It generated excessive noise, and this, combined with other aerodynamic faults, led to the project being canceled. Since the early days of aviation, engines designed for flight have made incredible strides forward. But there were really no major breakthroughs in engine types until the advent of the jet engine. Relying entirely on thrust, early jets could provide speed, but always at the expense of economy. And range was always a problem. In the early 1960s, an answer of sorts was found. For the first time, the thrust of a jet engine was used to power a large fan, and the fan jet engine was born. Typically, a fan jet produces about 80% of its power from the fan and 20% from the jet's thrust. That makes it extremely economical, but still capable of drawing on full jet power. In a normal fan jet engine, the fan blades are housed in a cylindrical tube. The unducted fan, like the fan jet, uses the power of a conventional jet engine harnessed to turn blades. But in this case, the blades are large and paddle-shaped and the air is not channeled through the circular duct that a conventional fan jet has. Rather, the blades are exposed in the same way as a traditional propeller. But in this case, there are many more blades involved. The unducted fan reflects a major effort to reduce fuel bills and is an ideal solution to making airline travel more economical. Still in its infancy, Unducted fans have been tested on several medium-sized airliners, and further developments may even bring a new kind of pusher power into common use throughout the commercial airline world. Many aircraft and airships have had both tractor and pusher propellers, but the German Dornier 335, called the Arrow, represented a particularly unusual approach. The Aero's propellers were placed at opposite ends of the aircraft, each powered by its own engine. 
It therefore had twice the power of a single-engine aircraft without the high frontal area and drag of a twin-engine plane. At the time, the concept seemed bizarre, but it worked very well. In fact, the Aero was one of the fastest piston engine designs of World War II, with a top speed of 470 miles an hour. Its cruciform tail had upper and lower fins and rudders. Its lower fin helped protect the rear propeller from fouling the ground during takeoff. The 335 was produced in two versions, a single-seat fighter and a two-seat night fighter. Both would have been formidable adversaries, but production had only just begun when the war came to a close. The Germans weren't the only ones who developed pusher-powered fighters. In 1939, the U.S. Army Air Corps announced a competition for a high-performance fighter. They were seeking a warplane with low drag, good pilot visibility, and high standard armaments. The Northrop Company responded with the XP-56 Black Bullet. It used a single radial engine that drove two counter-rotating pusher propellers. The engine itself was cooled by air passed through the openings on the leading edge of the wings. The bullet was supposed to wield two cannon and four machine guns mounted in front of the cockpit. Its streamlined frontal area made it a fast aircraft, but stability and control in this tailless fighter was always a problem. Compared to Northrop's pure flying wings, the XP-56 could never measure up. Early on in the flight test program, Northrop's test pilot was severely injured in a crash. So in spite of the fact that the design was modified, the Black Bullet never really hit its mark, and only two of its kind were ever built. The XP-55 Ascender was the Curtis Company's response to the Army Air Corps' call in 1939 for a high-performance fighter. Like Northrop's Black Bullet, it also had its share of stability problems. These were particularly evident at low speeds and during landings. Otherwise, the Ascender was a satisfactory effort, in spite of a layout that was highly unusual for its day. The prototype had a metal fuselage, cantilevered laminar flow wings with ailerons and flaps, and vertical fins and rudders at the wingtips. The forward canard-type surface performed the function of elevators. The XP-55's pusher propeller was powered by a rear-mounted engine, giving the aircraft a streamlined frontal area. Its smooth lines seemed even more exotic because of the plane's swept wings, wings more fitting of a 1950s jet fighter than for a late 30s prop plane. The original design called for a Pratt & Whitney engine with 2,200 horsepower. But that engine wasn't available, so a 1,200 horsepower Allison was fitted instead. It was no surprise when the Ascender's original design speed of over 500 miles an hour was never reached. Even so, it was a true groundbreaker. To compensate for the Ascender's lack of a tail, a small canard wing was mounted on the nose of the airplane. Ironically, the canard, the rear main wing, and the pusher propeller all echoed the designs of Glenn Curtis's old rivals, the Wright brothers. Slow in development, the Ascender just couldn't outperform or even equal the more conventional American fighters of the era. And although the design never went into production, its features were in many ways prophetic. The pusher propeller, the canard, and the swept wing are all commonplace on many contemporary planes. The most notable examples being the innovative home-built designs of Burt Rutan, like the Very Easy and the Defiant. Reflecting a half-century of developmental work in aviation design, even today's ultra-high-tech Beechcraft Starship reflects many of the innovations characteristic of the XP-55 Ascender. In its search for a high lift-to-drag ratio, Beechcraft created this twin-pusher forward canard wing configuration. In flight, the canard carries almost a third of the aircraft's weight. The vertical winglets, or tipsails, make the wing behave as if it were longer. 
while tiny vortex generators on the tip sails and on the forward wing help to improve aerodynamic performance. The Starship is powered by two Pratt & Whitney PT68 turboprops of 1,200 horsepower each. Placing the engines at the rear of the aircraft reduces the sound levels in the cabin. It also means that the engines can be placed close to the center line, making each engine's performance very balanced. The wing surface has been designed to efficiently direct airflow through the pusher propellers. The Starship's ventral fin serves the functions of protecting the propellers while also enhancing stability. Only a few years after the Wright brothers made that first successful powered flight on the dunes at Kitty Hawk in 1903, the pusher propeller dropped out of sight. While never completely forgotten, it somehow never really cemented its position as an important element in aircraft design. Many of the pushers attempted to break away from conventional trends, but none really met with any lasting success. Yet as flight approaches its tenth decade, some of today's most original designers are rediscovering the pusher and giving it renewed purpose in the civilian transportation field. To the Wright brothers, the pusher propeller and the forward canard were logical design features. These increased the control they had over an aircraft's pitch and reduced the likelihood that the plane would stall. Today, the canard wing serves exactly the same function. In a stall situation, it loses lift before the main wing and causes the nose to drop. Speed increases and the stall is avoided. But that's not all, because in a high-tech aircraft like the Starship, the forward wing does much, much more. Computers control its adjustment for sweep, setting the optimum angle for anything from high-speed flight to landing. The Starship and other contemporary airplanes that share the pusher engine and its forward wing design have taken one of the earliest ideas of flight, an idea born on the dunes at Kitty Hawk, and combined it with today's technology. In the process, they are blazing a trail to advances and achievements that the Wright brothers never dreamed of. You're watching the Discovery Wings channel. Coming up next, witness the evolution of battlefield tactics from the early days of trench warfare to the modern use of air power. Go behind the lines for modern combat next on the Discovery Wings channel.